to Bethel Church and our worship service. We've come to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and uh, it says we do that, so let's begin with, with some prayer. Father, this evening we come before you, our great and awesome God, and we've come and gathered to worship you, to give you the glory you so richly deserve. Uh, Lord, there's so much things that are happening in our world and our lives, and it's easy just to come and lose sight of you. And so this, these moments we've chosen to, to reorient ourselves to you, your presence in our life, and, and for you to receive the glory you so richly deserve. You are our God, and we lift you up this day. Uh, you have promised to love us and care for us. You revealed yourself to us, and, and uh, Lord, in these moments, we lift you up in Jesus' name. Amen. I talk. Stand as you're able, uh, this, uh, this first song is just a, a fun one that I used to do when I was a youth pastor back in the 90s called All Your Promises. Broken generation When all is 
what you've accomplished to rescue us and bring us to yourself. And we thank you for that. Lord, help us to live this out now, to recognize your spirit moving within us, the, the work of, of the Son and, and the, the, the love of the Father. We come before you and lift you up in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So just a couple announcements here. So we did not have the annual meeting on Wednesday nights, but we are rescheduled that to tomorrow at 2 p.m. here in the Fellowship Hall. So 2 p.m. will be the annual meeting tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow. Three more, one more time. <laughs> tomorrow, 2 p.m. Uh, Andy says, well, we have to hear it three times so that we remember, so. <laughs> Uh, also, tomorrow morning, Sunday school will be at 9.30. Uh, Mike will be teaching on Great Old Testament Prayers. And uh, what's our prayer this week? Solomon dedicating the temple. Solomon dedicating the temple. All right. Uh, great, awesome prayer. On Tuesday nights, we are doing a, uh, a series, sermon-based series. Ah, loosely sermon-based. Well, it's a 12-week study on Revelation. It kind of con goes in conjunction with the messages on on uh, Sunday and Saturday nights, but uh, it'll go in some different directions with that. But that's on Tuesday night. And then Thursday, Ladies Bible Study will not be meeting this week. Uh, they're gonna be, take a week off and they're beginning a new series on, on Joshua. And if you're interested in, in that, that'll be at, again at 1.30 and seven o'clock. And if you need a, a book and or a study guide, talk to Betty Lou and we'll get that to you. Anything else we need to announce? Today. Is that, is that tomorrow at 2 o'clock? 2 o'clock. All right. Uh, when? Okay. All right. Um, 
Well, let's continue worshiping our Lord uh, as we sing, I'd rather have Jesus and King of Kings. And you can stand or you can sit. It's, it's up to you, really. Really.
So Betty Lou and I went over to Ukraine. Our son Michael was there serving with the Peace Corps. And so we, uh, we took about 10 days or to two weeks or so and, and went to visit him. And, and while we were there in different places in Ukraine, uh, we were in the capital city of Kiev. And, and uh, he, uh, Michael, along with uh, another friend of mine, w we went to the World War II Museum there. And just amazing to look at World War II from the perspective of a different country and not one of the major countries. I mean, it's not, it wasn't Germany, it wasn't the Soviet Union, it wasn't Britain, it wasn't the United States. This was Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is in that precarious place between Berlin and Moscow. Uh, and as, as those are the centers of two of the larger uh, communities there, they were in the middle. And so when the Germans went to the east and, and were headed towards Moscow, they had to go through Ukraine. And when the tide turned in the war and they, uh, the Soviet Union fought back and drove them out, uh, they went through Ukraine and Kiev. And, you know, a lot of times you don't think about these small places that are in between and they don't get much of the headlines unless you're in one of those small places. And, and as we looked at their history and the things that they happened, the devastation because as the Germans came through the, and, the, and the Soviet Union left, they made sure there was nothing in terms of resources for the Germans to be able to use. Well, that means they had nothing. And the Germans came through and it took them a while, but they were able to, to, to fight their way through and then and move past them. And then as the Soviet Union came back the other way, again, resources were destroyed and the place was devastated. It was a place in the middle. It wasn't the main place. It was, it was kind of a buffer uh, for the Soviet Union so they couldn't get so easily to Moscow, and they paid the price for that. Uh, sometimes little places, again, we don't hear about them. And, and, and I say that because uh, the, the letter we're looking at this week is is to a church in a city called Thyatira. We've been looking at the, the seven churches in, in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, and, and uh, the first churches we've looked at have been in prominent places. Ephesus, just a huge place with all kinds of major temples and, and all kinds of great trade that was going on there. They had sea as well as land trade. Uh, then we moved up to, um, to the north to Smyrna. And then up to last week we looked at, at Pergamum, which is the capital city, the big, huge capital city, which had connections with the Roman Empire. Well, this week we moved just a little bit to the east, about 40 miles to a city of called Thyatira, a small city. It was not very important at all in terms of political stuff. Now, it, 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 it was at the, the coming together of two different valleys, and so uh, there was lots of trades there. So there's big union guilds that were part of the, the working class there. But as far as prominence, 
uh, the, the biggest thing that could be said for Thyatira, it was it stood as kind of a guard or a buffer for the capital city of Pergamum. So their eastern flank, there was at least something to stop them. It, when we looked at Pergamum, they had this huge hill, which was a great place for a fortress and, and a citadel. Uh, no such things existed in, in Thyatira. It was going to put up a feeble defense at best, but at least slow people down enough for maybe the, the people in, in Pergamum to be able to deal with it. So maybe not the most important place, but in this place still, people lived, and they made their living, and, and there was a church there testifying to the Lord Jesus. And we, we read about this in Revelation chapter 2, and, and we're in, in chapter 2, verses 18 to 29 today. And it begins this way, chapter 2, verse 18. To the angel of the church in Thyatira, again, just a reminder, the angel of the church probably means the messenger. Angel means messenger as well as an angelic being. And so probably the, the, the pastor or the, the bishop in that particular community who would take this letter and then read it to the church and bring it to them. To the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will pay, repay each of you according to your deeds." Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery just as I have received authority from my Father. I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, and in each of these letters, uh, there's characteristics that are described of Jesus from chapter 1 that come into each of the descriptions of who Jesus is to these letters. And so in, in this particular one, we have this description. These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. So that description of his eyes and, and his feet are described there in chapter 1, and so brings that back. And, and uh, uh, lots of symbolism just going on from this in the identification of who Jesus is. Uh, the message comes, first of all, from the Son of God. Now, that's the only time in, in all of Revelation that that phrasing is used of Jesus. It's used several times in, in the scriptures before that, in, in John's letters and in lots of Paul's letters, but this is the only description here in Revelation, and it's linked to, to Psalm chapter 2, which gets quoted later on in verse 27. But uh, the Son of God, who's, who's the one with blazing eyes and burnished bronze feet, Oh, there's, there's lots to that, right? So the blazing eyes would be piercing eyes and, and probably fits in with that later description of, of the one who searches hearts and minds. And uh, again, an overall description for God in general. There's a, there's a, a phrasing similar to that in, in the book of Chronicles. When King Asa uh, is, gets himself into trouble, one of the prophets comes to him and says, uh, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth, searching for those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Um, uh, it, is a, it is a blessing to know that the Lord is looking for those, but in, in Asa's case, in that particular instance, it is, it, he also is seeing those who fail to do that. And, and that's something about these blazing eyes. 
they can search and see past whatever things we might put on the outside and know exactly what's going on in hearts and minds. Uh, as for feet like burnished bronze, I mean, uh, bronze is, is a strong metal. It's shiny. It, it's actually an alloy of copper and tin. And uh, for a long time, it was the hardest, most durable material available to human civilization. Uh, just about every major civilization went through a time where uh, they utilized the mechanical properties of bronze and helped to make better tools and weapons. And, and a bronze is actually even harder than pure iron and, and more resistant to corruption. And so the one with these piercing eyes and whose feet are solid and incorruptible, he notices them. I know you, he says. And what does he know about them? Well, this starts off really good, doesn't it? Verse 19, I know your deeds. And what are their deeds? Your love and faith, your service and perseverance. When we looked at the, the church of Ephesus, one of the things that they were criticized for was that they'd lost their first love. Well, not so in Thyatira. A love was spilling out of them and their faith in God continued and and they were serving others with the gifts God gave them and persevering through all that. And, and so all these things that are, are core parts of being a community of faith were being lived out. And even more so, they're continuing to grow. Uh, uh, the last part of it, now you are now doing more than you did at first. Uh, these are great descriptions of what, what discipleship ought to look like. As people come to faith in Jesus, uh, their hearts are transformed and they, they love. Uh, uh, many of you are familiar with the, the fruit of the Spirit from the book of Galatians, that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. And, and uh, the description of it as fruit of the Spirit means as the Spirit lives in our life and we're, we're our healthy followers of Jesus, then these things grow in magnitude in our life. And such it was for this community. There's lots of things that are really going well for them. And Jesus knows that. And he points it out right away. He's like, this is what you're doing well. But there's a nevertheless a less again. And that word, once, when, when, when good things are being said and the word nevertheless comes, well, that's not good. And such it is here. Uh, nevertheless, I have these things against you. So, so he starts off celebrating authentic discipleship and the things they're doing well, but then he talks about some internal cracks and flaws. And, and these are internal things. These are things that are not happening from outside, but from within the fellowship. And begins to describe this woman, Jezebel. Now, for those of you familiar with the Old Testament, the, the, the name Jezebel would be familiar to you. She would be found in, in the books of 1 of, uh, Kings and 2 Kings. And, and Jezebel was a woman. She was the, the, the daughter of King Ethbaal from the Syrian area to the north of where Israel was. And she married the king of Israel, a guy named Ahab. And, and she brings... Uh, her life and everything to, to Israel, she also brought her gods, uh, the, the worship to Astarte or Asherah, as well as the worship of Baal. And, and one of the, the great battles you might remember in, in First Kings is the prophet Elijah is going to stand against the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah, and they're going to have this great big showdown asking who is the real God uh, as part of that, uh, Elijah, the prophet of Yahweh, uh, goes to the prophets of Baal and goes to Ahab and Jezebel and says, okay, here's the deal. We're going to have a contest. You get a bowl, I get a bowl, you're going to make an altar, and we're going to ask for our God to come and bring fire from heaven to see who really is the powerful God. And one of the things about the, the God Baal of the Canaanites was that he was the god of storms. And so you would think that the god of storms ought to be able to bring some fire from heaven or uh, a lightning to be able to just, you know, just bring one down. And, and so as, the, as the, the 
contest begins, uh, the prophets of Baal have the first shot at it, and, and uh, they're praying, and, and it's getting intense, and, and Elijah starts mocking them. Hey, where's your God? Maybe he's busy. Maybe he's uh, uh, in the bathroom or something. Uh, and, and they pray even more intensely, uh, but nothing happens. And then uh, the prophet Elijah prays to Yahweh, and he says, Lord, uh, let it be known today that you are God. And he, and he prays, and, and uh, he takes his altar, and he, he douses it with water repeatedly, so much so that, that there's this, uh, this, this moat around the, the altar is, is completely soaked. But fire comes from heaven and destroys it and, and establishes the true God. But this reference to Jezebel here is there's someone within their midst who's something, doing something similar as Jezebel was in the Old Testament. She is misleading people away from their walk with the Lord to follow other things. And, and part of the description of that by, uh, leads them into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. Last week I mentioned that in Acts chapter 15 when the church was thinking about how do we incorporate Gentiles and Jews within us and what should the Jews do? Do the Jews have to be, or to the Gentiles, do the Gentiles have to become Jews to become Christians? And they said, no, they don't have to do that, but this is what they must do. They must avoid sexual immorality and eating food sacrificed to idols. These are things that are not okay. But somehow this woman who is a prophet uh, is how she's described, is teaching and guiding people into this. And now what's likely happening is, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, there was commerce that was coming into Thyatira. There was these work guilds, and, and part of each of the work guilds, there would be some sense of, of coming to a temple and, and having feasts and sacrificing to a particular god. And if you were going to be part of that guild, which was important uh, in some circumstances, sim- similar to a union or to uh, a trade organization, that if you don't take part in this, you're not going to have any business because no one will have anything to do with you. Uh, if you're not certified by this organization, it's not going to happen. But being part of these organizations meant oftentimes doing these practices. Uh, some temples had temple prostitutes and, and, and very loose morals would be part of it. And, and so for the followers of Jesus to have nothing to do with this uh, was part of their call. And yet Jezebel, somehow with, with whatever sense of being a prophet or prophetess that she has, she's saying, you know what, this is okay. Sometimes we just need to, to go along to get along. And, you know, we can, we can do both. Uh, is likely the direction of where this was going. Now, she's probably a part of the church because there is some sense as, as Jesus is describing her, he says, she has been given the opportunity to repent. I've given her time to repent of her, her mor- amoud- immorality, but she's unwilling. And so she's going to be cast on a bed of suffering and um, part of the description of this is, you know, we, we, we talk about life and faith and, and being able to receive forgiveness. But in living our lives, repentance must happen at some point. The consequences of continued rebellion uh, will be eventually uh, face dire things. Uh, Jesus is pretty strident about this. This kind of activity must stop. Now he does say, um, and this is in verse 22, so I'll cast her on a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. All right, so you, you, you have, you have this, this woman, Jezebel, and again, that's probably just a name connected to her, probably not her real name. It, I mean, it, 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 it's an emblem of her. And similarly, if we called someone a Benedict Arnold in our country, we know what we mean by that. It's someone who is a traitor. To call someone a Jezebel would be someone to, to lead people away from God and towards other things. But so, so those who would be her followers and would refuse to repent, repent uh, those who possibly could still repent, um, they need to take a look at it. Because, and here's this description of who Jesus is. Those blazing eyes, they search hearts and minds. 
we think we can escape the scrutiny of fellow man, probably we can. I mean, you can, you can fool a lot of people a lot of the time. But you can't fool God, the God who searches and knows hearts and minds. Uh, he knows everything. And we're not going to pass that. And says, I will repay each of you according to your deeds. And again, unless you repent. When the third group are those who have nothing to do with that. And again, the ones who are, who are described in great detail at the beginning. Those who are, are demonstrating love and faith and service and perseverance and work. He says, you know what? This is not going to happen to you. you. Those who haven't fallen into her trap. Um, uh, there's this description of Satan's so-called deep secrets. Uh, not fully sure what exactly that's describing. There's... Uh, Paul in some of his letters talks about searching the deep things of God, but, but in some of the, the, uh, the cultish or occultish groups, they, they talk about secret knowledge that you can have and, and special wisdom that you can get. And, and, uh, and Jesus almost mocks this, this so-called secret, deep, these, these deep secrets of Satan. Uh, they're nothing. But there's, there's those of you who have not held on to a teaching. And for you, here's what I need you to do. Hold on to what you have until I come. So part of his promise, I'm coming back, but the call to continue to be persevering in your faith. Live this out. And then as that continues on, we get to the end. And, the, and uh, like the other letters we've seen, there is some call for what's going to happen for those who are victorious, who live this out faithfully. And, and uh, a lot of this is, revolves around Psalm chapter 2. Uh, the second psalm. And uh, let me just read uh, from Psalm 2, verses 7 to 12. Uh, it says this, I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will dash them to pieces like pottery. Therefore, you kings, be wise, be warned, you rulers of the earth, Serve the Lord with fear and celebrate his rule with trembling. Kiss his son or he will be angry and your way will lead you to your destruction for his wrath can flare up in any moment. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Uh, this, this second psalm is, is a messianic psalm and, and really brings out some of these keys about the son of God and how the son of God will have things laid before him and not a coincidence that in his description here, this is the Son of God in, from verse 18. That in verse 27 quotes exactly, the one who will rule them as an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. But even before that, I will give authority over the nations. What Jesus is saying here is, you know, you know we think that the nations have power. And they have might. And we, we look at uh, those who rule, whether it's in our country or in other countries, and, and the message is here. Above all those rulers, there's the one who rules them all, who has authority over all of them. And for those who follow Jesus, who stay connected with him, will be part of this that looks over them, to have authority over even these biggest things because of our faithful connectedness to Jesus. So what do we make of this? You know, sometimes when we think of bad things, we think of them on, on kind of big scales. Now, for those who are in rural areas, uh, we'll look at the big cities as the places where, where bad things happen and, and uh, things are out of control. But in this letter to this insignificant city, in this church that exists there. Part of the message is bad things can happen, even in little places. Sometimes we think, you know, there's not, that couldn't happen to us. You know, whether we th we're thinking in terms of here on Washington Island or, or in particular here at Bethel Church, there's no way. You know, we're small and we love the Lord and there's no way any, any sin or wickedness like this could happen. Well, I think the message here is watch out. Be attentive to what you're doing, how you're living, and what you're listening to. Hold on to the teaching of God and, and, and scrutinize the things that you're listening to, the things that are happening. 
whether I'm saying them or they're happening in other of our Bible studies or other places within the church, we need to be attentive to these things and stay connected to the word of God at all times. Uh, Another part of this is that sometimes these bad teaching can come from gifted people. Uh, Some sense of this Jezebel is that that she has a a prophet-like standing within their midst, that she has some giftedness that people are going to, and she has some sway over them. But sometimes people with lots of charisma and, and, and great gifts, sometimes they can get distracted or they can get deceived and and sent down a road themselves. And and this woman here, apparently that's happened and she's believing and leading others down this line. Potentially that's what's going on there. Uh, And that's not to say that it's just because she's a woman because we looked previously and we've seen another person in another church called a Balaam, uh, going back to Balaam in in the Old Testament. So it's not about gender it's about the message. What is God saying through this? There's also indications of, of women who had tremendous roles within the early church and were serving as, as prophetesses and leaders. And so, it's, again, it's not about that, but it's about the heart and the message, what's going on and being said in this. What do we do? How do we live this out? Um, my sister Gretchen and her, and her husband Brian, they've got a second home in Pleasant Prairie, Wisconsin. They, they, they make their, their residence in Chicago, and so it's a nice distance to get out of town. Pleasant Prairie is just on the other side of the border in Illinois. It takes them about 35 minutes when traffic is good. Not always so in Chicago, but... Uh, so this, it's just, again, just about a, a mile north of the, of the Illinois border. Well, this summer... Chicago was placing a lot of restrictions on their residents for all the states that were having increasing cases of COVID. And Wisconsin was one of those places. And their kids were involved in activities and it was getting towards the uh, middle of August and, and school was going to be starting. And, and their house was just on the other side. And uh, the way that you get it is through this little rural area and, and you, you come across no one to there and they live in their, their little house and they don't have to see, they see less people there than they do in their place in Chicago and, and it would have been tempting for them to just, just kind of fudge that and, and you know, because it was safer on some level. But one of the things that would happen as well as they came back and, and were re-engaging, whether it was school or some of the other activities their three boys were in, one of the questions they were asked was, have you been to any of these unsafe areas? And for them, they had these three boys watching them. And what do you do with that? When here they have this place, it's their place. And it would be just convenient for them to go there but they made choices during that time frame not to do that. To not have to, one, go through the quarantine, but, but two, not make up something just so they could get away with it. The larger thing for them was, what were they teaching those who were watching them? As we live our lives, people are watching us. People within the faith community are watching those who are leaders those who have some kind of standing or uh, seem to have some maturity in their faith. And it's essential for us to continue to be vigilant about our own walk and our own faith and maintaining our fidelity, our faithfulness to Jesus our Lord, keeping our eyes fixed on him. Uh, Sometimes we make so many decisions just based upon ourselves. But the faith community is bigger than just ourselves. What we do, how we do it, it matters. And the little things that we teach get passed on. What do we believe and how is it lived out? If the church in Thyatira was good at love and faith and service and perseverance and growth. They struggled with holiness within the body. And there's the challenge for us.
to take a look at ourselves, to scrutinize ourselves and one another. What does that mean? Uh, part of it means uh, maybe sometimes having some hard conversation or asking hard questions. So what's going on in your life? Sometimes that means building the trust, but sometimes as well it means being able to say, I'm going to take that and I'm going to respond to that. We live in a world where secret things are happening all the time. Secret sins in the life of church members is, is not at all uncommon. I mentioned last week uh, two of this, my, my heroes in the faith and these secret things in their life that got covered over, that got bypassed because they were so prominent. That can't be. Remaining faithful, being vigilant, staying focused, that's our call. Let's stand for closing prayer. Father, this night again we come to difficult topics as in some of these churches and, and yes, gl glorious, wonderful things that were happening and, and thank you just for the, the, the picture that you give us of this church and the, the things that were going on there, the, the great things but also the disturbing things and Lord, as we think through that in our lives, um, Lord, help us to, to rejoice and, and glory in, in the, the, the great things that are going on, the, the lives that are changing and developing and moving. And, um, but Lord, we'd ask that as you look at us with your eyes, that if there's things in our lives that we need to repent from, we need to walk away from, that you who search our hearts and our minds and give us opportunities to repent, that we will do that. And Lord, as we look at brothers and sisters across the way here, Lord, help us to love them, love one another enough to be able to, to ask difficult questions, to say, what's going on with that? Do you need some help? Lord, we know that ultimately you are the judge, you are the one we are accountable to, but you use each, other, each of us as part of your body. And when one part of the body is ill or diseased, it affects the whole. Spirit of God, work in us, move in us. And as we prayed earlier, may we continue to grow and develop and reach into people's lives. And you know, there's things we need to be called into account for. Lord, help us to do that willingly, repentantly, before we get to those places where you say, thus far and no further. We thank you that you love us and you want the best for us. We come to you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you this night.